Hi everyone, my name is Marwa Khan. I'm a global ambassador and I'd like to welcome you all to the Global Citizenship Workshop today. So today our speaker is Dr. Tole. Dr. Tole, she is, oh, sorry. Let me introduce the global citizen, what it means. So join us today to learn how to be a global citizen of the world. This workshop will give you a better understanding of the idea that one's identity can transcend geography and pol or political borders and how can we as students take part of the movement. That is the goal of the workshop, to explore this idea. Now I'm going to introduce the guest speaker today, which is Dr. Tole. She's an associate professor of political science at the School of Public Affairs. Her research focuses on critical approaches to asylum, migration, and foreign policies in Europe and the Middle East. Dr. Tole has published a number of articles on the politi politics of immigration into Turkey. At Penn State Harrisburg, she mostly teaches on, interna on international politics. Dr. Tole is also faculty director of Penn State Harrisburg Model United Nations. Please welcome Dr. Tole, everyone. Thank you. So shall I just take it from here? Yes. All right. Hi, everyone. So let give me just a second until I share my screen and start the PowerPoint. Yes, I think that's it. Do I still get to see you? I think so, which is good. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for, for coming here. Um, I would actually like to encourage you, sorry, to encourage you to turn on your camera if you can. I, I, I leave off of the you know, feedback that I receive from people. So uh, you don't have to, but if you're willing, uh, I'd be more than happy to yeah, see your face. And I see a few here, so that makes me happy all the time. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Global Ambassadors to organize this, um, mostly because it's uh, global citizenship is a topic that I have been um, kind of indirectly engaging with through both my life and my research. But I never really got to tackle it directly. And so um, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to, um, to think about it, to, to organize my thoughts a little bit better, uh, and also have an opportunity to engage with, uh, with other people on that particular topic. Um, I will be presenting, I think the best way to summarize, again, it's not a really formal presentation. It's more, um, again, me presenting somewhat organized thoughts on the issue. Uh, and I think one of the things that, that would be uh, summarizing uh, the situation is uh, that I'm taking kind of a critical approach. Um, so I will actually presenting some of what I see as being the, the issues or the shortcomings of the concept of a global citizenship. But as you will see, it's not because um, I don't think global citizenship is a wonderful thing. It's more that the way it has been used as a concept and enacted in the real world, I think has been problematic at time. And so what you, you will see, I'm kind of concluding on the need to rescue uh, the, the idea and the concept of global citizenship uh, to make it better and to make it a little bit more aware uh, by keeping this kind of critical approach and this is a critical awareness of, uh, of the situation. Uh, so I'm actually going to start, I think, what uh, will now become um, a more of a conversation, if I can use, yeah, which is uh, starting with defining issues. And I'm not going to be proposing a definition. I don't really want to settle that topic, but start with, uh, with the, the question of what really is global citizenship. Um, and I think I'd like to, before I go move on with my notes here, I would like to hear it from you. What would you say is global citizenship? Who is a global citizen? How do you know if someone is a global citizen or not? Uh, I'd like to hear it a little bit from you. So do I have some volunteers who want to share some ideas here? 
Um, so I think a global citizen is um, someone who is open to learning about different cultures and kind of acknowledges that they live in a world where um, they will interact with different um, cultures, so they should be open to that. Okay, I think, yeah, there's this idea of openness is a very, is a very good, important one. What else? I think it's a concept of identity that once identity it's not limited by their own nationality or culture but instead um, they're part of a bigger and a more global world yeah and i think you you had uh, that in the introduction right uh, this idea that it transcends all the form of identities in particular the kind of national identity which which tends to be dominance in the way we we organize the world oh yeah as a as kind of um um, I guess initial note, uh, I, I am located, as you heard from the introduction, I am a political scientist and I study international politics. So there are many different ways to approach the idea of global citizenship. It's actually probably a concept that is mostly used in the literature by uh, education. Uh, people that, that focus on, uh, on education is also quite dominant in the psychology literature, but we also use it in um, kind of transnational studies and migration studies. Uh, to some extent and in international politics, but I, I have my bias obviously as a political scientist, so I'll, I'll be talking more of the kind of political um, aspects of it um, as, a, as a result. What else would you say is a, is a good way to define a global citizen? Um, I think awareness is also important to be aware of um, global issues that are happening currently, or even just being aware of different cultures and like their values and traditions. Yeah. So, so I guess my question is, how do we know who is a global citizen? Or rather, who, who is not a global citizen? Are we all global citizens? Or are we not all global citizens? I think our actions are what define us as a global citizen. It's the way how we are accepting of others or how we are intrigued to learn about different cultures or speak up about different issues. I think that's what define like gives us the role of a global citizen. Okay. So and I, I think this is indeed something that is very dominant, right? The idea of global citizenship uh, is very much based on um, on kind of participation and engagements. Um, but there is some different perspectives as, you know, some people say by definition, if you are part of humanity, if you are a human being, you are by definition a global citizen, whether you are aware or whether you're active towards it or not. Whereas some other are saying that no, global citizen is, is, is a kind of a, almost a title or a qualification that you acquire by doing specific actions or by having a certain level of awareness and et cetera. So, so there are some, some differences also on, on, on that issue. Uh, to what extent is global citizenship um, similar or different from national citizenship, which is really where the term citizenship kind of evolved from? How do you know who, what is your national citizenship, for instance? I guess um, natural citizenship involves duties like voting and being aware of like uh, local issues. Whereas I think in the United States, we have an advantage of the diversity here. So there are many opportunities to engage in global citizenship because there's a lot of organizations um, that operate like globally, if that makes sense. Right, and this is a very interesting point, right? Because we associate national citizenship so whether you are U.S. national or an Indian national or, you know, Nigerian national, et cetera, um, with the right to vote, with having the possibility to have a say. Um, do we have that with global citizenship? Is there an equivalent when we talk about global citizenship? Um, I don't know if we have um, more of a direct power, but I feel like we still have some sort of influence. I may be wrong. 
And would, would you, what do you have in mind? How do you have an influence? Um, so um, not to get too political, but right now there's a lot of happening in India with um, Punjabi farmers. I don't know if anyone has heard of it. So I myself cannot like vote on issues regarding that, but I can spread um, awareness for that issue, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I still have some sort of influence, but maybe not a direct influence as like an Indian citizen would have. Yeah, exactly right. So I I think we will be talking about some of the um, some of these issues, but the um, going back to the powerpoints here, um, there there is no real consensus as to why what exactly global citizenship is, and actually there are some who say that it it there is no such a thing as as global citizenship. But with within the debate, we have the idea of you know to what extent is global citizenship a status or a title. Um, with the side question being to what extent is it a legal status or legal title and I think on that the the question is clearly no it's not it's not a legal status right it doesn't have any form of kind of legal or institutional recognition although it can have some institutional recognition but but basically again when you compare it with the idea of uh, national citizenship you don't get a passport that tells, oh, this is a global citizen. Um, you sometimes have as part of some exercise, and you know, we, we've had some word fest here where you would be given kind of a passport and, and things like that. But those are more kind of symbolic uh, symbolic things. Uh, the, the, the kind of passport that you have that is associated with your nationality or with your, with your citizenship rather, um, with your national citizenship, uh, gives you access to a number of kind of rights. Uh, we don't have the equivalent really for, glo for global citizenship. So a lot of people are saying, you know, this is not a, a, a legal status um, but it can still be a status and a title and actually um, you have some universities that give certificates in global citizenship you have places that gives award of global citizenship so it's still something that you can acquire usually through a number of deeds it's not something that you automatically get um, even though again there is that, that discussion that you know in a sense everyone is a global citizen maybe not everyone is aware of it or not everyone decides to act on it but that global citizenship is, is somewhat universal by definition because it's about being part of, uh, of kind of the human family as a whole. Um, a lot of people talk about global citizenship as being an identity or even maybe a mindset. So uh, I think it goes back to the, the, this idea of awareness or even identity that, that Naufal uh, mentioned. So it's about you know, something that is really at the core of who you are as an individual of how you envision the world around you and how you think about you know people that are near to you and people that are further away from you people that are part of your immediate community and kind of daily community people you interact with you know in real life or virtually increasingly apparently uh, versus people that you don't know people who live you know maybe very far but maybe people who actually live very close but you never had a chance to really interact because you are in kind of different networks um, so do you how do you think about the difference between with, between those people and some people think you know it, it, it's important to focus on the people that are around you with whom you have connection because this is what you know the, the real uh, thing of social relation. Some others say, you know, it's very important from a moral and ethical point of view to think about everyone as having kind of the same kind of value, same human value, same, you know, uh, rights to access to human dignity, uh, whether or not we have a chance to interact with, you know, we cannot obviously interact with the other 7 billion people in the world, uh, but we can think of them and we can include them in our reflection and in our decision making when we take certain actions, etc. Um, some people talk about it as being more of, you know, it's something that cannot necessarily be, but is kind of an endpoint, something that should be an objective or an ideal. Um, and we'll talk more about this when we we'll talk about the connection between citizenship and national citizenship. Um, but this is going back to this idea of, you know, if citizenship is a legal status, um, then maybe one day we'll have something like indeed this idea of global citizenship as again a status that everyone can have um, and, and some people are, are, are tying this as we will see with the whole idea of human rights uh, and in particular the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was signed in 1948. Uh, before that human rights was not was sometimes thought in principle as a universal thing that you know you have because you are human or you are because you are a man uh, 
but in practice, it could only be guaranteed, it could only be protected, it could only be provided by specific states, and states provide that to their own citizens. Uh, so the issue was what happens if you are, if you don't have a citizenship, if you are may maybe a stateless person. What happens if you are no longer or if you are disconnected from your states? You know, do you still have those rights or not? How, what, what can we put in place to ensure those kind of protection? And so some people are saying, you know, maybe one day we'll have a status, we'll have a recognition that we are all global citizens. And in a sense, this universal declaration of human rights is already, already kind of being a first step towards, uh, towards this particular idea. Uh, but a lot of that discussion ends up to those two questions that we've been kind of been tackling already, um, which is, you know, who is a global citizen? Um, <clears throat> and again, the, the, there is a sense that, you know, maybe everyone is a global citizen, maybe only people who are actively uh, doing something about it can be a global citizen, maybe something that you acquire with experience and with specific good deeds. Um, and then there, again, there is a question as does global citizenship even exist? And we'll go a little bit deeper into that, into that contrast. Um, to understand really what global citizenship is, I think it's important to draw comparison between national citizenship and uh, global citizenship, mostly because, um, again, the term citizenship is one that has emerged from specific domestic context. And usually the idea is when you talk about national citizenship, you are taught, you are, you are, you are talking about the connection of the individual with a specific political community. And nowadays, that political community is a state or government. There's a, we, government is the term used in the US. State would be the term used outside of the US. Um, but so it is the way the individual is attached to a specific a situation, to a specific a state or government. And that state and government, it is about the relationship between the individual and that, and that government. Uh, it is usually attached to specific rights and responsibilities. So the states provide a number of rights uh, to, the, uh, to the individual. And typically the concept of citizenship has been developed in the liberal state or in the democratic or partially democratic state. Because again, it kind of recognizes that, uh, that citizens, this is the difference between citizens and subjects, right? In, in, uh, in, in previous centuries, the, the dominant mode of relationship between governments and individuals was a subject, right? Different kings had their subjects that they had certain rights upon. Um, with the move from subject to citizenship, you have this idea that it's, it's more of a contractual relationship, so it's kind of a voluntary relationship. Um, and the state, the government has to provide a number of rights. One of them is for citizens to have somewhat of a say often through elections, but not necessarily into how the state and the government is being run. Uh, but citizens are also expected to have responsibility. So they also think that I expected from citizens that can range from many different things. It can be about you know, paying tax, it can be about um, you know, conscription and having to serve in military armed force. It can be about the expectation that you, know, you are active and engaged uh, you know, in, in charity work or in, in kind of service uh, learning and et cetera. So you, are, you have kind of different definition as to what a citizen is supposed to do, but you have this kind of balanced situation of both rights and responsibilities that are attached to the concept of citizenship. You also have, and this is something that is a little bit more murky because it's, it's no longer based on laws, but it's more based on social practices or political practices. You often have an, a, um, a certain idea of what is a good citizen. Uh, and, you know, citizenship, national citizenship in that sense is different from global citizenship uh, because, you know, when you're born, you become a citizen of a, the specific country, uh, either the country of your parents or the country where you are born or sometimes both. Um, but by definition, everyone is a citizen, right? You don't have people that are, or at least today in the norm that we have today, everyone is a citizen. Um, but then you have more or less good citizen in most countries have this ideal of a good citizen is someone that is engaged, is someone that is you know, altruistic and will kind of engage in the political life, will engage in the communal life, will engage in the community through many different means and there are many different ways to participate and to being engaged. But there is this um, expectation that you, know, you, you don't just passively live your life disconnected from everyone else. Uh, this is not what is really expected, like beyond the legal responsibilities that you have, you also have um, 
there are also expectations of you to be to be uh, particularly responsive and solid in, in solidarity with others and etc. Uh, in principle, the idea of citizen at the national level has this sense of universality. So I, sorry, um, universality here is within the confine of the state. So it's it's universal, meaning it's for everyone, but within the state. But again, you have this idea that everyone or most of everyone who live in that country uh, will be a citizen. It's, it's something that everyone has an access to. And you also have this uh, sense of equality that you know, every citizen is equal, right? Usually you have this idea, if, if you have in a country that have election, you have one citizen, one vote, uh, you have this kind of equal understanding that we are all, at least from a legal status perspective, we are all equal. Of course, we know from history that the history of citizenship has not been one of universality and equality. Um, if anything, from the very beginning, I think most people trace back the notion of citizenship to uh, ancient Greece. Um, but even if you look at the you know, political history and development of the UK or France or the US, or uh, you know, a lot of the, of the countries that we considered as advanced democratic with this kind of modern understanding of citizenship today, the history of who is a citizen and who is not has been one of power relations of usually kind of the dominant uh, group within the society that is recognized as a citizen, usually because they are recognized as being fully human, but then other segments of the population that are outside of it. So it would be based on race, it would be based on gender, it would be based on uh, social and economic status. Uh, there would be kind of many different ways uh, to, again, exclude and include a different um, different parts. So actually, again, there, there is a, the value and the ideal that is about university and equality, but the reality has been very different, that it has been about power relations and it has been about inequalities. Now, if we want to translate that to the global level, uh, we start raising all kind of <laughs> different kind of questions, right? Because if citizenship is the same thing that we had at the national level that we just want to apply at the global level, now we are in a different situation. So if it is an attachment to a specific political community, do we have a global political community? Uh, some people argue yes. You know, we often call and talk about the international community. We often talk about how you know social media and um, kind of new technologies has kind of really brought kind of a transnational movement of kind of people being aware beyond the national borders of what is happening. And so we have a sense of community that has been created. Some other people are saying, no, it's impossible to connect and to feel a sense of belonging with everyone else in the world. So we cannot have a global political community. By definition, a community has to be a subset of humanity. So there is some disagreement on that. If it's a connection to a state and governments, there is this big question of, do we have a word governments? So the short answer is no. But do we have institutions that are kind of slowly maybe moving us towards a world government or being some kind of a proto world government? And most people would be thinking of the UN, right? Is it kind of the, the beginning of the draft of something that would be the basis for future world governments uh, on which we can, that could, uh, if it becomes a government, provide a sense of citizenship? That is possible. Uh, we have actually the example of um, the EU, the European Union. So you have you know, national citizenship within the EU, but you also have a European citizenship. So you have this existence of a supranational kind of above national, actually legal status that is a real, um, a real form of, of uh, citizenship. So that could be happening. We don't have that now, but that could be happening. But then when we think of it in terms of global rights and global duties, well, global duties is a little bit more difficult to define from a legal perspective, but we do have global rights in the form of, again, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and a number of other kind of human rights uh, instruments, treaties and convention at the international level. Um, so this is something that, um, that we can take into, into consideration. Um, global duties, again, from a more moral or ethical perspective, some people will say, yes, we all have global duties, uh, but it's not articulated the same way um, than others. Um, this idea of good citizen, how do we translate that in, at the global level? Well, basically, it has been what we've been discussing already, right? In a sense, sometimes we think that 
are only global citizens, the ones that are engaged, that are active. So only the good global citizens are the ones who get the title of global citizen. If you are not really engaged and not really interested in the world beyond your uh, kind of smaller community, then you would not be one. Um, and then I think the last two ones are the one that really gets to the core of the matter that I think is, is of interest. Uh, to what extent do we have universal, like, universality and equality at the global level? Uh, here again, I think in principle, we think of the idea of global citizenship as something that everyone has access to, right? Any person that is part of the, the human, uh, who is a human being, who is part of, the, the, uh, of humanity uh, should have access to it and we would all be there on an equal matter. But in practice, is it the case? And I think the point that I'm trying to make here is that most of the time when we think of global citizens, when we think of you know, who is a model of global citizenship, we actually tend to think of a relatively smaller subsets of really privileged people, usually young people, for some reason we associate global citizenship with youth. Um, you know, of those people who are able to travel and kind of do those uh, kind of voluntary service work in foreign countries or, you know, who speak many different language and, you know, sometimes are doing actually very important and, and, and very good things. But this is the kind of thing that they are also able to do because they have a certain privilege and they have access to uh, a number of things that they can do. We don't tend to think of global citizens as people who are you know, within vulnerable groups and within vulnerable, uh, vulnerable countries. One example is, for instance, when we think of, let's say, you know, I'm going to take an example from my country, um, a group of you know, French students going to, I don't know, to the Democratic Republic of Congo to help build a hospital, for instance. We will, will tend to think of those French students as being, oh, they are global citizens because they're engaged in this kind of you know, charity work and they're really kind of helping. We typically don't think of the workers there who are working alongside them to build the hospital as also being global citizens. Uh, so we, 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 we tend to, and that will be one of the things I argue, we tend to actually not really see and recognize that the way oftentimes Global citizenship is articulated in real life is actually based on uh, on also power relation and inequalities uh, that usually comes from a specific history. So to talk a little bit more about um, Yeah, actually, maybe before before I move to the next slide, one of the other questions that I didn't put, but I think I want to I want to ask to you is when you think of global citizenship, do you think of it as being an alternative and something that kind of replace, right? If you are a global citizen, you are no, you are no longer a, an Argentinian citizen or a Chinese citizen, or is it something that you build on top, right? Is it, do you maybe even first need to be a good national citizen in order to be a good global citizen? Um, is, it, is it one or the other, or is it things that actually come together and build from one another? What do you think? I like to put you on the start, on the spot. Um, so I think it's like um, I <laughs> I think it's something like you build upon because okay. I know my parents are from India, so they were Indian citizens first, and then they came to America and. Um, then they got their um du the dual citizenship so i think it's kind of like that but like instead of um like the dual citizenship it's the dual citizenship as a global citizen and your national citizen any any other insight i think indeed there, there, there is a very interesting discussion also about the, the whole idea of multiple or dual citizenship um as a any, any uh, other way to think about it? So there is some comment on the chat. I don't see. Yeah, so hi, Disa. I hope I pronounce it not relatively correctly. Um, I think it's something that can be built up on like an identity, because there seem to be a lot of objectionable aspect of global citizenship that government might not agree with. Yeah, so I think th this is this is one one of the issue. You, I think you will encounter people who will say 
you know, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a French citizen or an Italian citizen, right? I'm a citizen of the world. I'm a global citizen. And so some people will kind of think of it as, you know, I don't want to be tied to a particular form of, you know, nationalism uh, or particular form of attachment. I want to think of myself as being, again, kind of above um, any kind of national identifications. Um, some others will actually think of it as indeed something you build upon. Um, I, I yeah, I don't think there's a there's a lot. I mean, I think at times you you may have the 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 way the issue is articulated in practice is when you have contradiction, right? So when maybe your country is doing something that might be good for the interest of the national community, but might not be good for the interests of the global community. Uh, then how do you, you know, which one among your multiple loyalty, which one will prime, right? What, what will you think as to what will be, uh, will be important? Um, Philip said, I also think of it as something that you build upon similar to the European Union, but on the global level, it would be a good bridge between the world countries, but I, I do not think it can replace national citizenship. Yeah, and you actually have a lot of people who make the case that it's the, the whole idea yeah, that will come later. But the whole idea of global citizenship is not practical. Like we cannot, like we cannot, we don't have a world government. So if we cannot protect the rights that we would be given to, to global citizens because it doesn't exist. We also cannot just assume that you will have this sense of solidar solidarity happening between all of the members of the human community. Because again, we, we don't have that capacity <laughs> socially to, to, to feel and to care and to feel solidarity with that many people. We usually do with only the people we can interact with. So, so again, there are those tensions that are not necessarily really, really resolved. Um, but yeah, there, there, is, there is a lot of, of discussion about, you know, can you be a dual nation, national? Um, what does it mean to be a dual national or a triple national or whatever? Um, is, it, is it a good thing? Is there one that should prime over the other? Can you have, can you have multiple ones? Uh, some people think of multiple citizenship as being a step towards world citizenship, right? The more citizenship I have, if again, you have the, the chance or the opportunity or the privilege to be able to have access to multiple citizenship um, is maybe the best way to show that you have multiple allegiance. And as a result, of course, you're not gonna prioritize only one. You're always gonna be considered having kind of a broader worldview. Uh, again, some other are saying if you start to have multiple citizenship, you start to dilute the kind of strong bonds that we need to create between the individual and the political community. And we create this kind of apolitical and possibly amoral, some will say, kind of, uh, kind of individual. So you have all of those different aspects. Um, all right, moving on. We were having a discussion uh, early on whether I would be able to speak for that long, but apparently that's not a problem. Uh, I had prepared for just 10 to 15 minutes, but since I was given more time, I end up having. Um, so th this slide is about uh, talking about kind of the principle of global citizenship and the way it is of, of an, uh, often envisioned and has been kind of created. And it will repeat some of the things we've discussed. Um, but basically, most of the time, we think of global citizenship as kind of a corrective to nationalism. So that may mean to add to national, national citizenship, or it may mean to replace national citizenship. We just had that discussion. Um, but the idea is nationalism in itself might be a problem. It's not just nationalism. It can be other form of uh, parochialism or other form of kind of identities um, that basically the, the idea is instead of focusing, I'll put it in the next one, instead of focusing on identities that by definition separate us from others, right? Whether it's a religious identity or an ethnic identity, maybe even an ideological identity. Um, usually you are par partially defined by the other, right? You are defined by the one who are not of your religion or you are defined by how people who are not of your ethnic groups or not of your nationality are. And so the, the idea here is those kind of identities, nationalism being probably over the last 200 years, the most powerful one. Um, you know, nationalism is good because it creates a sense of solidarity with the other member of the national group. And this has been very instrumental in the creation of the modern nation states that we have. But it also creates really strong other rings towards people who are not part of the national group. And so this has been the tension regarding the whole issue of nationalism and the, the discussion, right? It, it's good for certain things. It's very dangerous for others. And of course, um, we, we've seen the extremes 
of nationalism in uh, World War One and World War Two in, in in Europe that really took nationalism to the peak. Um, and so the idea is if we, if we create, if we think of us as being global citizens beyond national um, national citizenship, that, that actually really helps us uh, um, focusing on humanity as a whole and not focusing on what, on what separates us. Um, it is seen as being particularly important because there are a lot of things in the world that are not right, <laughs> that are not how they should be. There are a lot of really kind of dramatic situation. There are a lot of inequalities. There are a lot of, of things that, you know, that could really be improved upon. So again, the idea of global citizenship is if you're not just focused on your own community, which may also have some issues and some problems, but are maybe overall a little bit better off than some other communities, um, then, you know, it, it's important to, again, move and look beyond your, your own community and again focus on humanity as a whole and try to identify places that have kind of more needs and can be helped on, uh, on different level. The issue with, with this approach is indeed, is it even possible? And, and some would argue, is it even desirable? There are much fewer people who have asked this question whether it is desirable, but there are a few who do again thinking that we need to focus on kind of tangible community as opposed to this abstract idea of, uh, of global community. But uh, on the other side, if you look at global citizenship as practice, we see, and again, I started to discuss this already earlier, we see that citizenship is uh, often actually practiced as, um, as, as something that is connected to position of privilege and position of dominance. So to understand that, we need to understand the historical context of colonialism and imperialism and the current context uh, and history of uh, neocolonialism and neoimperialism. And so we all live in a world that, you know, about 100 years ago was fully uh, or almost fully colonized by uh, mostly European powers um, who, well, different regions at different time, um, who has created kind of structural inequalities between colonies and the metropole uh, that actually have this kind of long ranging effect. You know, you have a very strong history of exploitation and domination and, you know, slavery was a big part of it. Uh, economic exploitation was a big part of it. Use of, of uh, natural resources, extermination of some people, etc. that creates um, a, an important context, mostly because a lot of this colonialism and imperialism was actually justified by principles that look very similar to the principles of global citizenship today, right? A lot of the, of the colonials were going with this kind of missionary aspect of, you know, we are here to help you. <laughs> We are here to show you what civilization is. We are here to, you know, show you what maybe Christianity is and kind of the, the right God is. And we are here to teach you, you know, what modernity is and teach you what real education is. And, uh, and so the, you, you had this kind of, um, you know, feeling of superiority from, 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 from the colonial actor uh, who, you know, if you had talked to them, I'm guessing at that time, would have appeared as maybe being altruistic, right? They would say, you know, I'm, 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 dedicating my life to helping others and living in another continent to, to help those other people. And this was part of the rhetoric uh, that sometimes is not, again, too dissimilar to some of the things that, that, that we hear from some people who, you know, want to be global citizens. And again, sometimes coming from the global north or from the west and going to the south and trying to help people with sometimes a very similar mentality of we know what is best and we're here to, to come and help you, which recreates those hierarchy of, again, superiority and, uh, and people considered as inferior. We also have, uh, and yeah, the colonialism and imperialism, according to people who study it, is something that is actually continuing just under new forms nowadays. So we don't have the... Um, the, the, the colonies no longer exist or very few territories are, um, but you still have forms of domination that continue through different forms of political pressure that will still have the same impact. Um, on top of that, you have the context of neoliberalism, which is really the form of uh, kind of global capitalism that has become really preponderant with globalization. So since the 1980s on, that has also created um, kind of a new class, and Saskia Sassen is an author that, that wrote a lot about, about this, has kind of created in a sense a, a class of what she called global citizens, who are mostly actually, you know, either uh, corporate actors 
So, you know, the, this class of expatriates of people who work for multinational corp corporations, most of them coming from the global north, living possibly in different places who, yes, are kind of, kind of talk many different languages. Yes, are really fluent, are traveling the world, kind of really know a lot of things about, about the world and would be considered as global citizens, even though it's not clear that they are really decreasing inequalities or they're really undoing unequal power structure. Um, we also tend to thinking of, again, this kind of small class of, um, you know, privileged people who are able to travel and kind of engage in maybe humanitarian work and work that has a kind of a good purpose, but do that again because they can, because they are in this position of privilege and it, by doing so actually reproducing the, uh, the, the existing inequalities from before that. So uh, that is something that is, again, creating by uh, this form of neoliberalism that a lot of people are saying the problem with neoliberalism is it's actually making inequalities stronger and it's actually keeping um, almost in a permanent stage who, who is part of the elite and who is part of kind of the, the more vulnerable uh, segment of the population. Um, you have, again, this discussion of... Um, you know, we often think of the global citizen as being this kind of humanitarian entrepreneur, uh, this kind of self-made altruistic person who comes and help and kind of save others by doing all of those actions. Um, you know, sometimes by traveling, sometimes by getting engaged in some other things. Uh, and you, there is a lot of kind of yeah, mythical understanding and romantic understanding of the role that, that, that certain people play. Again, usually a lot of those projects are not really hearing the voice of the, 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 um, the recipients of the, the help, the service. Uh, and so this is again, kind of continuing to, to create some form of inequalities. And it also typically continues to create some form of othering, right? You have the global citizen who is kind of the center, and then you have the others. The others are the ones who are being helped, who we don't typically think as being maybe at the core of being first and foremost the global citizens uh, as a result. So there is, is this inequalities. Uh, and all of this, again, contributes to reproduce hierarchy uh, overall, as opposed to really undo them, which is why it's in principle global citizenship is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to spread more equality and it's supposed to create more solidarity and maybe better understanding of, uh, of the others. Uh, so what we need, I think, is again, not to, um, not to throw the concept of global citizenship at all, but we kind of need to rescue it from the specific ways in which it has been implemented and, and put in place in practice. Um, and I have to say that um, I'm, I'm someone who, who has been working a lot, including on this campus uh, with the UN. Um, and the UN has really been kind of this umbrella organization of a lot of organizations that engage in issues of development and humanitarian assistance. And, um, and they have sometimes, I think, perpetrated uh, again, despite all kind of good things that have been done and some successes, um, they have also perpetuated this idea of, you know, international people, but mostly coming from the global north, coming in the global south and kind of helping them and, and kind of as a way to recruit and to uh, help gather some resources. Uh, but this has also kind of perpetuated some of those images and hierarchical views of the world that I think is problematic. So I think we need, to, when we engage in global citizenship or when we want to be a global citizenship, it is very, very important to kind of be aware of those critics and really try to reappropriate the concept in a way that is really truly about kind of undoing the hierarchies and kind of creating a kind of true uh, solidarity. Uh, I think what some, well, something that needs to be done, and this goes back to a lot of what Hannah Harens uh, was writing about in the 50s and 60s, um, is radically think differently of who is naturally a global citizen. And uh, her argument was basically the stateless and the criminals, or not so much the criminals, but the people who have been criminalized, meaning the people who have been constructed as, as criminals because they have done something that was deemed illegal at a specific time. And we're talking about you know crossing the borders or maybe consuming a specific drug or something that ethically is kind of arguable whether it is in itself illegal or not, but because by law it is, it has been constructed by society as, as people being criminals. Um, but yeah, people who are stateless, so who have lost their citizenship one way or the other, um, people who are undocumented, so who typically have a citizenship but, but may not be connected or may not be protected anymore by the, by the country of origins, uh, and the criminals, because they have the one who have lost their rights, by definition, they are the one who should be given rights from an imaginary kind of global actor. 
So they should be at the core of who a global citizen is because they need it. Basically, it's more of a pragmatic argument of, you know, they are the first one because they don't have any alternative. They don't have a national citizenship or they don't have access to the full rights of national citizenship. So they are by definition, the main uh, global citizens. Not the only one, I think all of us can be, but we have to think of them being kind of the, the one that naturally and almost spontaneously become global citizen just by, by this position. Um, I think it's also very important and that would be particularly true for people who are in position of privilege. Uh, so that would be true of people coming from, uh, in particular from people coming from former imperial and colonial states such as mine, uh, the friends. Um, but that would be true for the UK, that will, would also be true for the US in general because of the history of US uh, neo-imperialism. Uh, that, you know, it's, it's, it's always very easy and tempting to go out in the world and help the rest of the world. But by doing that, we tend to criticize others before really looking inward and understanding what the history of our relationship maybe with those other countries, what problems, similar problems we have at home, but we don't see, we don't describe them the same way. And so it's, 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 I think in order to be a, a, a good global citizen, you first need to have very good knowledge of yourself. And you cannot have very good knowledge of yourself without having good knowledge of the others. So it's part of, you know, you learn about others in order to be able to understand what the alternative is, but mostly to, in order to be able to understand uh, who you are, who you are as an individual, but who you are also as a nationality or as a specific groups uh, within, uh, within, within the national body. Um, and engaging in local activities. So I think that going back to, uh, you know, being a global citizen probably start at home and start about the things you can do around you locally, um, keeping in mind the interest of, you know, the rest of the world. This is where you become a global citizen, but you don't necessarily need to go on the other side of the world in order to become a global citizen, right? You have to engage with people first around you because this is your immediate, uh, this is your immediate responsibility in a sense. And then, of course, and this is my last point, uh, you have to think of um, global citizenship as being first and foremost about acquiring knowledge. And this is this is in order to, in, to go into this inward looking and uh, kind of local engagement. Um, so, of course, I'm not in education for <laughs> for um, the, the reason why I'm you know teaching, uh, because that was my own conclusion, I guess, already a couple of, uh, of years ago. But it's really important to, in order to be a global citizen, to learn. And again, to learn as much about others as you are about learning about yourself. Uh, but also, it's very important to be very open-minded and to be very critical of everything that you're learning, right? So you, even when you read about something that is critical, you have to be critical of the critics, right? It's it, always maintaining a, a form of kind of critical knowledge, understanding and hearing voices from um, more vulnerable and marginalized people, what they have to say, uh, understanding which voice is really hegemonic and is kind of overpowering, which other voice are being less heard. Those are very things that are very important. And within that acquisition of knowledge, I think what is important is to engage in de-essentializing and de-exceptionalizing knowledge. And what I mean by that is oftentimes when we learn about other cultures or other countries, um, we tend to have very essential understanding of those other countries and you know the culture in that particular country is this, and this is how they eat, and this is how they speak, and this is, and we 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 tend to create knowledge that is very homogeneous, like they're all the same. <laughs> and we also tend to have knowledge that is um, kind of permanent. We don't see how things change over time. We don't see the variety within and we don't see how things change over time, right? We have this kind of permanent, immanent culture that kind of never really change. And so it's, um, and so this is, this is, I think, particularly important. Also de-exceptionalizing knowledge. I was um, listening to a podcast just a couple of days ago that uh, was making very, just to give you an example, making the point for de-essentializing knowledge regarding um, Gulf countries and in particular uh, Dubai and the UAE. And the argument was about scholars in the field. They say, you know, whenever I say I'm someone who studies Dubai, I always hear about, oh yeah, you know, it's, a, it's all about, you know, oil politics and it's all about, you know, political Islam and it's all about those, those issues and it's all about exploitation of migrant workers. Um, and they say it's very difficult to have, you know, those are, this is what's really essentialize um, what the, the Gulf is according to this kind of external observers, uh, but without seeing that, yes, there is exploitation of migrant workers in, uh, in Dubai. 
but there is also exploitation of migrant workers here in the US and there are exploitation of migrant workers in a lot of countries around the world, including most of the countries of immigration. Um, but we tend to see that exploitation as being different and because it's based on culture and it's based on different, they don't have the same kind of rights and, and regulation. And so we see that as being really a problem. Whereas ours, we don't tend to see it. It's more hidden. We're not necessarily comfortable discussing it. So we tend to, to put it aside. Uh, so this is what we mean by de-exceptionalizing kind of not necessarily see the others as being different, but see the commonalities in some processes that a lot of those processes, increasingly, because we live in a globalized world, are kind of global processes. And it's, it's about global structures. And again, structures of the economy, kind of more normative structure about identities and kind of racial identities and et cetera, that creates different, but actually very deep down similar problems in different countries. So seeing the commonalities and seeing how, you know, it's, it's, it's not just the other one that is bad and, you know, you don't really pay attention to, to what's happening at home, but really seeing the parallels of the problems and also the, the parallel and the solution in different places is particularly important. Uh, yes, I like the, the comment from Emily that you, it's very important to develop uh, critical analysis of any source that you have, including the more established one, the better one. I mean, it's always better to read a peer reviewed uh, journal than something that is not peer reviewed because it has been reviewed. But if it has been reviewed by people who basically agree with the same hegemonic discourse, it may still not be, you know, really assessing and looking at all the different voices uh, that exist out in the world. So it, it's important to, to really hone those skills of critical thinking and apply them everywhere all the time. You know, be critical of any kind of social author authorities, including your, your faculty and including your professor, including me, including what I said today, <laughs> right? You, you try to always replace it within its context. You know, what was my agenda here? The, you know, I, I clearly had one. <laughs> Um, you know, was I kind of being fair to different to different views? What what was the thing? It's really important to systematically have that. This is, I think, how we grow as as global citizen, and as I would argue, this is how we grow as critical global citizen, which is what we what we all need to be. And that was kind of all I had, and we still have some minutes for a little bit of a discussion. So I think uh, now Fall has another um, slide for the question, so we can we can use that one. But yeah, this was a little bit theoretical in terms of presentation. Um, I think that was what I was mostly interested in. Uh, but we can also maybe put them into context if you have some specific, uh, you know, real words, uh, examples of, you know, good examples of maybe what it is to be a global citizen or question about how to proceed or how to avoid some of the pitfalls. Uh, I think that could be, that could make for a good discussion. I'm willing to share an experience. Um, I had the privilege of uh, traveling to Uganda a few years ago, and we were part of a rural rural community that had a history of um, others coming in, like you were speaking about Dr. Tole, who thought they knew what this community needed. And they would implement their ideas, and maybe their ideas would um, benefit the community for a year or two, but then it was never sustainable because it actually wasn't what the community needed. So it was just interesting um, when I arrived with my Ugandan friend and a couple others, we went with the intention of um, listening to community leaders. Uh, we kind of interviewed and spoke with a couple of them. Um, we sat with women in their homes and just tried to understand from their perspective, what does your community need to thrive? You know, is it a well? Is it education? Is it accessibility to other resources? You know, what does that look like? And um, my highlight of that trip was just hearing uh, one community leader in particular, he and I went for a long walk and I was just asking him questions, trying to understand. And it was just a highlight for me to hear his heart for his community, his ideas that were on his mind. And then it's like, well, how can we partner together to help you implement these ideas for your community? And it was just a whole new experience for me. And I just saw the beauty of, um, you know, coming together. Hopefully we were both operating as global citizens in that interaction. 
but um, I learned so much and I taught very little, <laughs> but I think we both really benefited. Um, so I really appreciated your challenge on, um, you know, how we define global citizenship and, um, you know, how we implement that when we're interacting with others. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, a lot of these are based on also kind of more personal experience I had, including one that's with hindsight, I would probably should have done differently. Um, but, but I think one of the, one of the lessons from that literature is that, you know, traveling is extremely important and useful. And of course, <laughs> with the pandemic, it's become a little bit more complicated. Uh, but I, 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 you know, in, in no way, I think we are making the case that there should be less travel, although there is a, a climate impact uh, aspect of it, which is also important. But, but uh, traveling is, again, exposing yourself and exposing others to different cultures, different ways of doing things. Um, is extremely useful. Um, the problem is most of the time, and again, there are different types of travel, you know, from touristic business, humanitarian, etc. But the problem, oftentimes, the assumption is that for some of those humanitarian trips, is that you know I will be helping, uh, and actually, probably <laughs> they are helping you. <laughs> they are helping you understanding the world. They are helping you understanding what is really happening, and you end up benefiting a lot. Uh, and they probably do as well because they get some kind of exposure as well. But it's not the kind of, you know, I'm going to tell you what to do because, you know, I know I'm coming from this amazing country that has figured everything out. And, you know, it's just a matter of you implementing the same thing. Um, so that that is one thing that is a problem. I personally encounter and encounter a lot um, because I'm doing research on migration and refugees in particular. Um, I had tried early on and I gave up really early and I kind of felt bad for giving up, but now I realized that it was actually the good way to go. Uh, I was often asked, you know, why you don't have, why you don't inter interview refugees? Why in your articles you don't have um, kind of direct encounter with, with refugees? Um, <clears throat> and the, the main reason is it's, it's very difficult to have that kind of encounter with refugees and usually if you have it's because through life you have developed a friendship and developed a relationship with someone um, but going into refugee camp and saying hey i need data for my research so i need to take you know an hour of your time and i need to ask you a question that is going to be you know have you to recount some very traumatic past and you know what because it's neutral scholarship, I cannot give you anything in return. I cannot promise you a visa or resettlement. I cannot give you money. I cannot give you anything. Um, is ethically extremely problematic. And yet you have a lot of people going in the field and kind of setting up those, those, those kind of interviews without, again, kind of fully thinking about kind of the ethical and moral implication of wh what it is really, how do you really engage with people? Um, and it's actually not that easy to encounter the other, right? Even if when you travel, typically you are naturally geared toward this kind of transnational space of, you know, hotels and restaurants and, and places where, you know, other transnational, international expatriates maybe kind of evolve. Uh, and you encounter local people that are already very much um, engage with foreigners uh, so you, you it, it's not it's not really easy to encounter the world I think in many ways new technology is helping us helping us a lot because we can have access to social media because we can have access kind of create friendship and create relations those can actually be a lot more uh, a lot more meaningful and also international education um, I mean, Global Ambassadors is, is an amazing example, but having international students coming here and all being in the same place and interacting with one another uh, is, just, is, is just a natural way for, you know, you're not just saying, hey, I pick you because, you know, you are from Vietnam and I'm interested in Vietnam and I want to learn Vietnam, but more kind of spontaneously kind of develop relationship and friendship with people from different countries and unexpectedly, unwillingly, maybe sometimes you end up learning a lot about that culture, about the, that society and, and those kind of things. So those are uh, of particular interest. I'm seeing the time um, oh, going up, although I'd love to talk for so much. <laughs> So um, can I just add one more thing? Yes, if, please. If any, um, so I was having a conversation with my friend about this. Um, so I took this program in high school called IB, International um, Bachelorette. Um, I don't know if anyone has heard of it. It's supposed to give you education that 
makes you fit for like the global world. That's what they advertise it as. But I was talking to her how in our English class, when we had a uh, world literature, all the books were from a European author and we didn't even read any books from um, Asia or Russia or any other countries besides um, the continent of Europe. And uh, I was thinking about how po problematic that is because it um, adver advertises itself as a um, education for a global citizen, but yet it's excluding so many countries. So um, I'm trying to like explore and expand my literature too now by reading books um, other and making sure like looking at who the author is. But um, do you have any other advice for college students on how they can be better global citizens? Uh, I, th I think reading is amazing. <laughs> reading and being aware, indeed, being aware of your sources. And what, one of the problems we have, even me as an instructor, is that there is this kind of vicious circle of, you know, most of the literature, most of the scholarship has been developed in the West or in the North. And so they are the ones that are most cited. So they are the ones that are the most important. So they are the ones that should be assigned because you know, in class you want to teach about the most influential part of the scholarship. But by doing that, you continue of valuing and creating more citation for that particular uh, piece as opposed to kind of open to more kind of uh, marginal um, literature that is probably even more important or even more at the core, but just didn't have the kind of exposure and visibility. So uh, I think being extremely aware of where your source are from, I know there is a new movement uh, in trying to make sure that when uh, faculty, when we present in class um, literature and authors, we have to uh, or is, we, we are recommended to put a picture of the person. So uh, we also get a sense of how much, you know, diversity we have from the authors. And when you always have kind of middle-aged white guys, uh, it gets problematic after some times. It doesn't mean that they should be excluded because they probably need to be covered as well. But um, I think sometimes we are just not, you know, just not aware of, um, of that this is the case. And so forcing ourselves to be aware and forcing ourselves to diversify, I think, is a, is, is a good way to go. Uh, there are a lot of really wonderful uh, books. Um, I'm not talking now about scholarly books, but more kind of novels and literature uh, that can be a very fun way to travel and travel with the perspective or looking at things from the lens of people that are you know, local to the culture that they are uh, kind of evolving within uh, that can be extremely eye opening. So I think, you know, doing what you do of, of, of trying to read literature from different places uh, can be also good. I would also recommend to read literature. On, like, I'm, I'm very interested in kind of post-colonial literature and people that, that were very critical of uh, the colonial system and the, the way the colonial system is kind of continuing. So it gives you a lot of tools. The equivalence in the US academia would be kind of uh, critical race studies that also would give a lot of tools and concepts in order to understand and to more systematically see where there is a kind of a hegemonic discourse and see where are the places to kind of poke at it and see some alternatives. And um, so those are also good in terms of arming you to, 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 to also better read the world because then it's not just about literature, it's not just about what you study in class, but it's also how you are in the world and how you interact with, uh, with different people. So yeah, uh, I'm reading from the chat. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Emily, for uh, for having kind of a more diverse collection in uh, in the library. Um, yeah, there's a lot that can be very good about, about other things. Dr. Uh, Tolay, one last thing. So we know that on our campus, there's a lot of organizations like Global Ambassadors, GLM, or even International Affairs Association that focus on the global citizenship concept. So do you have, uh, how would you utilize, uh, how would you tell students to utilize this organization to better, better appropriate global citizenship and avoid, avoid its meaning of privilege or dominance? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> I think the first thing that comes to mind, which is something I, I have a sense might be happening a little bit, although maybe not as much as what I had witnessed when I was a student, um, because I was both a student in my home country in France, where they, we had a lot of international students, and I was also an international student in Germany, Turkey, and the US. 
um, what, what tends to happen is there is an amazing natural kind of diversity multicultural group that gets created by international students coming together. But the connection between international students, so from all different kinds of countries, so this is amazing what's happening within, but the connection between these students and then the local students is a little bit more difficult to establish and it's less easy um, for a number of reasons, right? A lot of it is just about, you know, international students who just came into that country, that state, that city, that town. Uh, you know, face the same struggle of, you know, I don't even know how to do grocery shopping because I don't understand where it is or what to buy or how do we, you know, feed ourselves? Where are those, you know, small restaurants where I can buy cheap, you know, street food type of things. Um, so, you know, a lot of shared experience, you know, struggle with understanding the language. Um, I know that was for a long time. I, I couldn't talk with anyone on the phone in the US. I just didn't understand what people were saying. Um, so, you know, things like that of just share, sharing those difficult experience makes international students, it's easy and it doesn't matter which country you're from, right? You, you just have this, uh, this similar problem. Uh, one of the issue, and I know Global Ambassadors uh, has been very intent of trying to bring also American students to become Global Ambassadors, uh, but there is this, um, I think this, this automatic thinking of you are a Global Ambassador if you are already global, meaning if you're already you know, coming from another country. Uh, so I think creating more of that connection between kind of the local students um, you know, American or Pennsylvanian or Harrisburgian um, would be uh, would be one with with the international students. Um, how else can those? I think something that we we've been trying and not been really successful with the IAEA um, has been also connecting to not just American students but connecting with the local community. Uh, and I think that's something that my predecessor, Dr. Gilpin, some of you might know him, uh, was really good at doing, uh, maybe because he was himself a little bit more integrated in Middletown in particular, and he was able to bring people from the community to campus and have kind of students going and doing some projects with people from, uh, from the things. I, am, I was myself pretty new, I'm still, I feel pretty new in this area, so I don't have the same kind of connection. Um, and it's not that easy. Again, you don't just go on the street and knock on the door and say, hey, I, we want to talk to you and we want to meet you. Right? It has to be find ways to make it happen more naturally. So I think that's something that can be also worked on a little bit more. Um, I don't know what else you have some, I'm sure you guys have more ideas and uh, experience on that with everyone who is here in the room. I think maybe one way, um... We can work with local communities like Rotary, like Rotary, yeah? like what Dr. Gilfin usually do. And I think in the last year, like our IAA doesn't really connect with that community enough. Maybe one or two people do engage with Rotaract, but I think it will be better and in integrated if the whole organization uh, immerse in maybe Rotary or Rotaract activities for IAA, things like that. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Uh, and that's something we, I think we could actually do fairly easily. Uh, yeah, because we, yeah. good point. I think, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Tole, for presenting on such a meaningful and powerful topic. And I think we're going, yeah, applause for you. And I think we're going to welcome Wendy in because she's going to talk about a little, um, some of the global ambassador programs that we present. Sure. Thanks, Mara. I'm just going to take a quick minute to let you know that we're very excited um, to be offering these upcoming events in our spring semester. So the Global Ambassadors will be hosting, as you can see there, um, the World Poetry Recital, Lunar New Year celebration, an African Coffee Hour, Persian New Year, Norus um, celebration, Holy Festival, and an International Cultural Etiquette Workshop. So please look forward to joining us in the spring, and um, we will see you there. Sounds good. Thank you, Wendy. And I would like to thank you all for coming to our workshop today. And I hope you all got to learn something new and we can all together try and implement ourselves as better 
um, global citizen, something that I want to work on, and I'm pretty sure you guys all are interested in becoming better global citizens. So thank you guys for coming to our Zoom session today. Wendy or Mawa or Nofal, I'm not sure to whom I should ask the question. Um, I, I, I don't know what, I don't, ah, yeah, I had a conference, I think. But I remember I had volunteered last year to be on the word poetry recital. And it, again, it didn't work because I think I had